Thank you. Thank you so much, Duncan. First of all, let me say hi. This is me so that uh, you don't uh, peter me on the streets here yeah? so that you know who you're talking to. So it's such a pleasure being here today. And uh, I want to thank the DMMC for creating this platform. I think you're a very, very good um, source of inspiration, knowledge, and uh, networking for people who have diabetes, who are living with diabetes and hypertension. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Very much appreciated. So there are a number of questions that uh, had already been sent to me that I will start with. And then um, from there, we can keep on sharing on the platform. Uh, we have an hour. It's not a long time, but we'll give each question around five minutes each. So Karibu Sana, if you're here today, I'm sure it's either because you have diabetes or you have a close family member with diabetes or you're a healthcare worker who just wants to know more about diabetes. So there are very many people who are here for different reasons and I welcome you and I hope that some of your questions will be answered. And at the end, we'll have a few uh, minutes for just clarification or someone who has a burning question and really wants it to be answered, feel free to share. So we'll start with the first question that I see here that is asking, how do I manage my blood sugar levels? So that's a very good question. First of all, uh, I, I am assuming that we all know that diabetes is a state in which your blood sugar is higher than the required amount in the body. So the body has something called homeostasis. Homeostasis means um, we, we, the body likes, um, the way God created us is that uh, our bodies work in a certain um, set uh, regulation. Uh, for example, our body works best in a temperature of between 36.6 and 37.2. Anything above that is fever. Anything less than that is low temperature. So the same way our body works best within a certain set sugar level. So your body will most likely want to be just between this level to this level of sugar. Anything above that is high blood sugar. Anything below that is low blood sugar. So generally, when we are talking about diabetes, we are talking about anyone who wakes up in the morning and has a fasting blood sugar of above seven. So if your fasting blood sugar before you've eaten anything is above seven, that is diabetes. Anyone who has a random blood sugar of above 11 and has symptoms of diabetes, which include um, drinking a lot of water, peeing a lot, feeling thirsty all the time, sometimes craving sugar, um, erectile dysfunction, vaginal infections, tiredness, blood vision. There are quite a number of uh, symptoms. Some don't have symptoms, but if you have any of those symptoms, your sugar level is above 11, that is definitely diabetes. And then HbA1c, which is your three month sugar level of above 6.5% above 6 is considered diabetes. So any of that is considered diabetes. So now, once we already know what diabetes is, then now the next question is, once you are told you have diabetes, how do you manage your blood sugar levels? So um, management of blood sugar levels is the same of, as asking what is the management of diabetes because diabetes is a high blood sugar level. So managing diabetes is managing your blood sugar levels. So number one is understanding why you have the diabetes. There are different types of diabetes. And I know maybe here we have a mixture of, bo of both. There are those who have type one diabetes and those are the people who the body is not producing enough insulin or it, it stopped producing insulin. So uh, because of that, they're not able to convert the sugar that they eat into energy for the cell. So there's a lot of sugar lying around in the blood system, but it's not entering the cell. So we call that hunger in the midst of plenty. So the, um, the body doesn't have, uh, can't utilize the energy, but the sugar is there. So that is type one diabetes. Type two diabetes is where insulin is being produced, but it's not working the way it should be working by putting the, the, the sugar into the blood cell. So either the, the, usually there's a lot of resistance to its function. So think of it like a, a, a key in a door, you're trying to open the door, you have the key, but then there's a lot of resistance with the key. So you can't open the door because the key is, is jammed in the, in the keyhole. So that's what happens with type 2 diabetes. You have insulin, which is the key, but it's jammed in the, in the door. So it can't open the key. So the same way for type 2 diabetes. Apologies, Dr. Ari, just a moment. I lost, we lost you for a second. Please, please go ahead. Yes, I'll just, yes. yes. Whole, you had muted me. 
<laughs> yes, sorry, proceed. So uh, the, the main thing is first understanding the type of diabetes that you have. So those who have type one diabetes, how to manage their sugar level is by taking insulin. That is the, the way they can manage the sugar level. And then of course, of living a healthy lifestyle as well. So everyone needs to live a healthy lifestyle. Doesn't matter the type of diabetes that they have. And then the people with type two diabetes, their main issue is insulin resistance. And the number one cause for insulin resistance is fat. And fat is brought about by extra calories. So the number one way in which they can try to reduce their blood sugar is lifestyle change, making sure that they are taking good care of their calories. They are following uh, a routine that enables them to lose weight if they are overweight. And that means diet and exercise, because that's how you can induce uh, what we call a caloric deficit state where you're burning more calories than you are consuming. Then if you consume more calories, I'm um, sorry, if you consume more calories than you burn, you end up being overweight or obese. But if you burn more calories than you consume, then you lose weight. And type two diabetes has a huge correlation with weight. So one is exercise, diet, weight loss, and good lifestyle maintenance. So that's the number one step in managing blood sugar level. Number two step in managing blood sugar level is understanding something called self-monitoring of blood glucose. So um, a lot of times I see patients who come to clinic and the only blood sugar level they have is the one they have come with to clinic. So that one is very difficult to know how to even manage them because we don't know whether the sugar is high all the time, whether it's high only after they've eaten certain foods, whether it is high um, today because they missed their dose yesterday. And sometimes what the patients do is the day they go to clinic, they don't take medicine. So someone comes with a sugar of 15 and you don't know whether it's because they missed medicine or they're not they're doing well at home. So one of the good ways for managing blood sugar levels is doing self-monitoring of blood glucose, which I hope all of us are doing at home. If you have diabetes or if you have someone who has diabetes at home, ensure that you know how to test for the blood sugar and write them down and write the food that you've eaten that day with the, with, the, with the blood sugar level. Why? Because I usually encourage my patients to do that because it can help you identify certain foods that raise your blood sugar more than others. Let me give you an example. You can be three of you, um, maybe me, Duncan, and someone else. And we all, the three of us have diabetes. When I eat ngwashe, my sugar is okay. When Duncan eats ngwashe, his sugar goes high. Another person, the sugar goes even higher. Why? Because our bodies metabolize these foods differently. And so you need to understand how your body works. And the only way you can do that is by also monitoring your sugar when you have eaten certain foods. And you can attest to this. I have so many patients who tell me, ah, doctor, yes, I realize when I eat duma or when I eat bread or when I eat uh, such and such starch, this is what I realize. My sugar goes very high. And so it's good for you to monitor and compare what your sugar does with different foods so that you can know which foods to avoid. So you, the whatever makes your sugar goes very high, remove it from your diet. So that's why we usually say there's no real thing as a diabetic diet. It is just something of you need to control how much carbohydrates you're taking and you need to know which foods make your sugar go high and avoid those foods. So another thing in managing your blood sugar level is taking your medicine as required. So whatever medicine you've been written for, whether it is um, oral medicine or insulin, ensure that you're following and you're adherent to your pattern of, of taking your medication. So that's very, very important. Then now uh, the, the, the fourth important thing is also doing HbA1c. Uh, those are the lab tests that we do and uh, it checks your sugar for the last three months. And even if you don't do self-monitoring of blood glucose all the time, that test can also tell us whether your sugar level has been well controlled for the last three months. So a reminder, managing your blood sugar involves lifestyle change, using medication, lifestyle includes diet and exercise, and then also knowing which foods work for you as an individual because sometimes it varies. You might eat bread and sugar and the sugar level is fine, but someone else eats bread and the sugar goes high. And then ensuring that you do the lab test every three months or six months to ensure that your sugar level is within target. And usually we say we want any person with diabetes to have a HbA1c of about 6.5% to 7%. 
but there are some specific ones that we can allow above 7%, but we won't go into that right now. But generally between 6.5 to 5% is a good target to have. Okay, so that's question number one. Question number two was, what is the best way to take insulin? Now, I didn't know what exactly this meant, um, but it's important for us to understand that there are different types of insulin. So insulin was discovered 100 years ago, by the way, 101 years ago. And uh, it's, uh, so far, it has evolved. Initially, they used to take insulin from dog pancreas. And then they injected it directly. The first patient got uh, dog insulin. Then after that, they went to pork from, from pigs. So it was pig insulin. Then it went to human insulin. And now there's something called analog insulin, which is manufactured from a lab. So it's not from any animal. So you see there are different types of insulin and they've been evolving over the years. Uh, but the important thing to note is that the way we describe insulin is First of all, whether they are manufactured from the lab, that is analog insulin or human insulin, which is basically human. And then the other way we describe it is the, the time it takes in the body. So there's long acting insulin, which takes 24 hours. There's ultra long acting insulin, which takes even 72 hours. There are even some which are once a week insulins. There is insulin that is short acting, the, the ones which are rapid acting, which you take with a meal. So they act on the sugar level just for the meal that you have taken. So those ones last for just even two hours or three hours. Then there are those ones which are intermediate acting. Now, if we break down, uh, I will, you'll allow me to use the names of the, of the insulin products because that's how you know them very well. So there are those people who are using insulin mixed Mixtad is a very, very famous insulin. Um, it's very cheap, very widely available. And that one is what we call an like an intermediate acting insulin. So it combines two type of insulins. One is uh, short acting and one is intermediate acting. And that's why it is done twice a day. Sometimes it can be done once a day, but majority of the time it's done two times a day and it's a human insulin. It's not a manufactured insulin. So that kind of insulin is best taken uh, twice a day. And uh, sometimes your doctor will tell you to take it once a day, especially for those whose sugars are still not that bad. You can actually take it once a day, depending on what your doctor has said. Now, there are those who take what we call the basal bolus regimen. Basal bolus means basal uh, insulin of 24 hours. So you, you, you inject uh, an, a long acting insulin that lasts the whole day. You take it once. And then with every meal, you inject insulin. So with breakfast, with lunch, with dinner. If you don't eat, you don't inject. That's basal bolus. So basal bolus is different from premix. Premix is now kind of mixed. So that's why you'll find people have different types of insulin. Don't be scared. Don't be confused. They work differently. There's a reason why you you probably have been put on one or the other. However, if you are experienced regular, if you are experiencing regular hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar, if you find that the, the, the injection is tedious. If you're on a basal bolus and you find that you, you can't keep up with four injections in a day, then it is still a choice to go to the twice a day injections. For those who have hypoglycemia or very low or erratic blood sugar, analog insulins, that's the manufactured insulins are more stable. And so that would be a better option for them than the human insulins. So it's, it, it really varies. Uh, as to which type of insulin is there. So is there a best way to take insulin? We always want you to take your um, premix or rapid acting insulin before a meal, not after a meal. So just before a meal, if you are taking a rapid acting insulin, a few minutes before the meal, you make sure that your meal is uh, getting prepared. Then around 10, 15 minutes, you take your insulin. Then thereafter, you can have your meal. Um, you can take your premix insulin up to 30 minutes before the meal, uh, but please avoid taking insulin if you don't know whether you're going to take food, especially the rad rapid acting and the, and the premix. If, you do, if you're not very sure about your meal, it's very easy for you to get a low blood sugar. So ensure that your, your meal pattern is, is predictable. Then there's the long acting insulin. That one, it doesn't matter what time you take it, as long as you ensure that you have a timetable. So if you do it every time at 8 p.m., just keep it at 8 p.m. If it's 10 p.m., keep it at 10 p.m. That is the 24-hour insulin. So it's up to you to decide when you want to start that one. So I hope I have answered that question. But if, yeah, if I've not answered that question, you feel free to ask again. 
So now the next question is a bit shorter. The answer is short. The target blood sugar range. So just remember, fasting blood sugar target is between four to seven. Four to, to the, 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 the ones who we want to be around four to five are those young people. Um, they don't have any complications. They are very okay. You know, they, they, are, they are active, they are motivated. Four to five is even okay. But we take it to around seven for those people who maybe sometimes their sugar level goes low or for those who have quite some complications, maybe they have kidney problems, heart problems, heart failure, their feeding is not so good or people who don't have a lot of uh, support from home, you can take it to a target of around seven. But generally the range is four to seven. So what, there's what we call tight control and not so tight control. So if your doctor is giving you tight control, they want your fasting blood sugar to be very, you know, between maybe four and five or four and six, that's tight control. But if they say seven and eight is okay, that's probably not tight control. And there, there are reasons why also we prefer some people not to have very tight control. Then after eating, the target is around five to 10. So just make sure that after eating, your sugar is between five to 10. 10 is for the people who are not on tight control. Then five to seven or five to, ten, to eight is for those who are on tight control. So again, it depends. We don't have the same um, targets for everybody. We individualize the targets. So for example, if someone has cancer, stage four cancer and diabetes, I will not be so keen on making the sugar four, making the sugar five. I will allow the sugar even to be eight, 10, as long as they're comfortable. So everyone has their own target, but remember fasting four to seven, then after eating five to 10. Okay, then uh, the next question was, what are the new treatments available for diabetes um, to be aware of? So first of all, we all need to remember that as much as there are some new things coming on the block, the foundation of, of diabetes management is still lifestyle. You have to work on your lifestyle. Diet and exercise, maintaining your weight, those are important. So now when we come to the newer treatments, there is uh, weight loss. Why is weight loss important? Remember we said type two diabetes is all about diabetes, it's about insulin resistance. So your body is not utilizing insulin well. So the best way to make things better is by um, uh, re reducing your weight. And therefore that's why we usually say, try as much as possible to maintain a healthy weight, try as much as possible to ensure your BMI is within normal targets. So that said, um, weight loss can be done nowadays through other means. So there's bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery is where the stomach can be cut into a small size so that you feel full faster, or a balloon is placed in your stomach so that again, you feel full faster and you don't eat as much. And because of that, weight is lost. So that is a very, uh, the reason why I put it there is because it's now being used as a way to treat diabetes and high blood pressure which is different from before where we were really focusing on drugs. Now even procedures are a part of treatment. So bariatric surgery is a part of treatment. Secondly, we have SGLT2 inhibitors. Now those are drugs which help your heart to protect your heart and your kidney. I hope some of you are already on them. Um, these drugs are very important for anyone who has kidney disease, anyone who has heart disease. You have to be on a medication that is going to prevent you from getting worse and preventing complications. Remember the main reason why we treat diabetes is to prevent complications. It's not because we just want to see a nice sugar. It's because of the complications that come from diabetes that we are really trying to avoid. So because of that, SGLC2 inhibitors are a new, new well, not very new, but they've been around the block, but uh, it's still gaining traction in Africa and in Kenya. But it's one of the drugs which if you have heart disease or kidney disease, you have to ask your doctor to um, to put it as part of your regimen. And then there's another one called GLP-1. GLP-1, again, is a weight loss drug, but it also protects the heart. Um, it is a very expensive drug, unfortunately. That's why you don't see them being used a lot. One of them is called Liraglutide, uh, Victoza, and uh, it costs around maybe around 24,000 in a month, which is a lot of money for majority of Kenyans. That's why we don't use it that much, but it is in the market. And then there's another one called tizapatide, 
which is also a new kid on the block. Actually, it's even being used by Hollywood celebrities to lose weight. So they're even using it out there. It was a diabetes drug, but people are just taking it to lose weight. Um, so basically, it's one of the new drugs. It helps people lose weight. And again, remember, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, fat. So if you lose fat, you reduce insulin resistance, you treat the diabetes. So um, a lot of the new treatments nowadays are tailored towards weight loss because they realized the majority of people with type 2 diabetes are overweight or obese. So if you lose the weight, you're able to control the sugars better. So yeah, those are the new treatments on the block. The one which I will truly advise us to ensure that if it is available, we take is the SGLT2 inhibitor. However, remember, at the, the cornerstone of majority of these drugs is weight loss, but SGLT2 inhibitors do more than weight loss. They protect your heart and protect your kidney. So they are very important for those who have a high risk of getting heart attack or a high risk of getting kidney disease. Okay, then next question was how to prevent complications um, like nerve disease and kidney disease. How do you prevent complications? So I will tell you the number one thing that helps you co prevent complications. It is good sugar control. They have tried very many things. There are many expensive medicines, many not so expensive medicines that have been studied and nothing is as effective as good sugar control. So if you make sure your fasting is between four to seven, and your postprandial, which is after eating, you're consistently five to 10, and your HbA1c is to target 6.5 to 7%, your chances of getting complications are so low. But if you have poorly controlled diabetes, that's where the problem lies. So control the sugars first before anything else. There's no magic pill of, of, of preventing complications. It is controlling the sugars. But then, we have talked about the new drugs that offer protection. So on top of controlling sugars, there's now those other new drugs that, that can give protection to the heart and give protection to the kidney. And those are the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. But most of them are the SGLT2 inhibitors. So those ones, kindly, if you have uh, access to them, ensure that they are part of your uh, regimen. If not, ask your doctor if you qualify for them so that you can be put on them. And then uh, the other important thing about preventing complications is being aware. I can't tell you how many times I have found a patient who comes for dialysis and they didn't even know they had diabetes and they didn't know they had high blood pressure. So um, it's important to always go for screening or even people who already had diabetes, but they were not regularly checking and screening their kidneys and screening their eyes. So one of the main ways of preventing complication is doing screening. That's why we tell you to visit the eye doctor every year. It's because we don't want you to become blind or to start seeing blood vision for you to say, ah, let me go and see the doctor. No, you have to go every year so that if it's early, it can be found early. That's the whole point of screening. And the other thing is looking at foot examination. So if you want to prevent complications of your foot, examine your foot. I hope you've been taught how to examine your foot. It's very important. You need to know how to clean your foot properly, how to take care of it and how to examine it for any bruising, any abnormal um, uh, spots or wounds of the foot and leg so that they can be picked early. There are many people who lose their limbs or they have complications and get very bad ulcers that take long to heal just because of poor examination. And you guys know very well that when you go to clinic, the doctors don't have enough time to examine all the way from head to toe. So you'll go there thinking the doctor is going to do everything, but the doctor doesn't have time to check your feet. So you also have to learn and be proactive and look at your feet yourself. And then, but also make sure that they are screened by the doctor at least once or twice a year. So I check up every, every year, once a year, make sure that your feet are examined once a year, but even you do a self-examination. And then three, ensure that you also have kidney tests done. I know it can be expensive at times, but spare that 1,000 shillings to, make, to do your kidney test and screen and make sure that your kidneys are fine. And it's not just the, the usual kidney test. There's another one that checks the protein that is leaking from the kidney, which is very important. So if you can be able to do that, it, those are very quick ways in which you can prevent complications by screening early. Okay. So that's very important. And I hope you've taken that to note. And remember most of the time, 
some of the signs come early, um, like uh, the, like neuropathy, kuchomeka kwa migu, very common in people who have diabetes. When you see that, just know the nerves that are being affected down there, most likely there's also some, some effect on your kidney and most likely something is happening in the eye. They usually come together. So anytime you see that you're having nerve issues in your feet, please make sure you've had your eyes checked and your kidneys checked as well. Okay, and then uh, the next step was, um, the next question was about healthy lifestyle choices. What are the healthy lifestyle choices that we need to take as people living with diabetes and hypertension or hypertension? So um, one important thing that we've talked about is diet. I cannot uh, stress it enough. Uh, remember that we are all different. We have different caloric requirements, which means the calories I need is not the same that a Mjengo person needs. Someone who works at a Mjengo will need more calories. And I have had patients with diabetes who are Mjengo people. So I'm not going to tell them to eat a small ugali because they have to go and work the whole day at a Mjengo site. So those are people who you have to calculate how, much, how many calories they need so that they can still get enough calories to work and not get a hypo, which is a low blood sugar, but they're still able to have enough energy, but not gain too much weight. So it can be a tricky balance, but just the, the main thing is to ensure that you do not go overboard on the carbs, because remember your carbohydrates are the ones which are going to be converted into sugars. So as much as possible, ensure that you have a low carbohydrate diet, um, eat lots of vegetables, fruits, don't eat too much. Remember fruits are still sugar. I've had patients who come to me and they're like, hey, Dr. Mimi, ata, hey, ni Hey, nina kula uh, juice, nina tengeneza fruit juice, kila siku. Uh, I think there's someone who's muting and then they muting, they mute everybody. So, uh, yeah, so um, don't do too much fruits. Remember, fruits have sugar. Every time you take that capaina or mango, that's sugar. So if you put fruit juice, those are very, very many fruits to make one glass of fruit juice. So kindly remember, fruits go easy on them. You can take an apple in a day. You can take a small slice of, uh, you know, like a half an orange in the morning, half in the evening, but don't go overboard when it comes to fruits because they have a lot of sugar. So keep that in mind. I usually encourage my patients to take thorn melon. Thorn melon is really nice because it doesn't have sugar, but it has a lot of healthy benefits and um, other fruits which don't have too much sugar. Uh, but at the same time, if, uh, if, if you don't have fruits available to you, as long as you have vegetables, then that is good. And um, fruits, if you don't have them available, that sometimes there are some people who told me they don't have access to fruits, but try as much as possible to take vegetables. Now, protein, you can take protein if, as long as you're not allergic and as long as um, you don't have gout and you can take red meat, you can easily just take the meats that you can take. But remember, white meat is always superior to red meat. So uh, chicken meat, fish meat are actually really good compared to red meat, but red meat is still okay, but make sure that you are taking lean meat, not very fatty foods. Um, and that could be uh, a, a nice way to start. Then remember the other thing is exercise apart from diet, yeah? So exercise is very important according to what you can do. And uh, we try to say that do around 150 minutes of exercise in a week. So that is 30 minutes of exercise five times in a day or, or 50 minutes of exercise three times in a week week, sorry, five times in a week. So 30 minutes of exercise five times in a week is very, it's very appropriate. So um, if you can manage to do that, that goes a long way. But remember the target is weight loss and weight loss starts with the plate. That's the number one thing. And uh, an easy way of always remembering is just take uh, starch the size of your fist. So ugali, the size of your fist and uh, everything else, starch, size of your fist. Then there's a question about activities or hobbies to avoid due to diabetes. So um, the, uh, people with uh, living with diabetes should still enjoy their lives. They should still engage in activities like other people. Um, it shouldn't really limit you. The only people that should be cautious about the activities they, they take are one, people who have 
eye issues, eye problems. So if you cannot judge the distance very well, or you can't judge so that if you're walking or running, you, you're at risk of injuring yourself, please be aware. And then also the people who have neuropathy, neuropathy meaning that uh, they might injure their feet as well, depending on what kind of exercise they're doing. So if you have eye issues, if you have foot issues, uh, be careful, but still you need to exercise, but be careful. Then there are now those patients who uh, get hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar. Those ones also be careful. Make sure you have talked with your doctor before you undertake any exercise regime because you don't want to go through a low blood sugar after exercise, which is very common. So ensure that you've talked to your doctor so that you know how to adjust your insulin or your medication before exercising. Then um, there's a question about... Uh... Uh, Daktari, Daktari, with your permission, um, I just wanted also us to kind of like uh, look at our chat uh, uh, so that we could sort of like uh, uh, mix the questions a oh, little yeah, bit. Sure. Yes, yes. Yeah. So there's one question here that uh, says that ask Daktari if male diabetics should quality spams and therefore capable of impregnating or not. I, I don't know, sort of like a... Uh, uh, yes. Okay. So um, the thing about, that's a good question. The thing about some males with diabetes, majority of them have quality sperm, but they have erectile dysfunction because the problem is not with the sperm factory. The problem is with the, it's not the bullet that is the problem, it is the gun. So um, the, the, the thing is, it, it depends on how bad the erectile dysfunction is, but majority of the time we are able to give medicines and, um, and everything after that would work well. So the sperms themselves, are still quality spams in majority of the cases. So erectile dysfunction is a problem. So there's a difference between the two. Yeah. All right. Another question is uh, a diagnosis. I suffered severe muscle wasting, especially uh, on my thighs. Which safe supplements can I can assist me to bulk up? So, um, I mean, I don't think that is the scope of what we are discussing. Today, yes, I, I wanted really, actually to comment the same. Sorry, I'm just reading through so that um, uh, some of our members don't feel that they are ignored. Um, uh, so, sorry, yeah. are you able, Doctor, to pick the questions on yourself on the chat or can I go on? Uh, because there's another question that uh, yeah, somebody is asking. Have All right, like yeah. what causes shoulder mm. pain at night? Uh, again, can we just pick the ones which are yes, yes, to diabetes? Yes, because yes, again, yes. there are so many. Yeah, I know. I, I, I was I actually trying to go through. To yes, yes, yes. So if you're able yes. to access the chat, uh, let me pick the ones that are relevant from the chat. Please, let's go through the other lists yes. that are shared early as, as I pick the ones that I think are more relevant here. And uh, of course, there are, for example, no nutrition related and all that. Okay, okay. So, so, so what would you like me to do? Go on with the rest of the other questions that are, we had shared early from our okay, members. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Actually, they're almost over. We have like three more to go. No, no problem. Can... All right, all right. Yeah. So um, there's someone who's asking, what do you do if your blood sugar is too high or too low? So that's a good question. Um, remember, we said what the targets are supposed to be. Fasting of four to seven, and then after eating, five to ten. So what do you do if the blood sugar level is too low? First of all, low blood sugar kills. I would much rather you come to me with a sugar of 20 than come to me with a sugar of one or a sugar of two. So low blood sugar, we always have to find out why did it happen? Is it that the dose of insulin is too high or the dose of medication is too high? Or is it that the feeding pattern is not good? Because sometimes people inject and then they don't eat or they take medicine and then they forget the meal and then they don't eat or they become sick and they can't eat and they vomit and they've taken the medicine. So it's very important to always find out the cause of a low blood sugar and treat it accordingly. But remember, if you're getting low blood sugar, please go see your doctor. They need to change or adjust the dose of medication. The biggest culprit to low blood sugar out there is insulin and oral medicine like glibenclamide or gliclazide. Um, I don't want to mention the brand names, but I think I, should, uh, I know that there are those common it's, it's brands. A, it's fine, Dr. for our forum, because most of our members are actually from our WhatsApp group. I guess it's safe and uh, oh. hopefully most of them, hopefully they'll also be coming to see you. So it's fine. So those are things like uh, diamicron, uh, uh, no gluc, very common drug out there. Um, Amaril, 
So that class of drugs, the way it works is that it increases insulin production and it can make your sugar go low. So if you're on those medications or insulin and your sugar is going low, please, you need an adjustment of your drugs and you need to be seen by the doctor. And also, if you know that your feeding pattern is going to change, for example, you're, you're doing fasting, people who go for Ramadan or even Christians who decide to fast, please make sure you change the dose of your medicine or talk to your doctor so that before fasting, you know that, hey, this dawa, I need to maybe stop, stop it when I'm fasting or I need to reduce my insulin like this when I'm fasting. So always be prepared. Now, what do, do you do when your sugar level is high? First of all, check what have you eaten. That's why I kept on telling you when you're doing um, self-monitoring of blood glucose, write the meal that you've eaten. Because you might find out that consistently, every time you eat a certain food, every time you eat matoke, your sugar goes to 20. But other times, your sugar is fine. So you need to know what foods are these that are correlating with a high sugar. That's one. Two, find out, uh, did you take your drugs? Sometimes we forget. I know. So also remember, adherence to medications. Make sure that you're following your medications well and make sure you remember. Because one of the most common causes of high sugar is just people not being adherent to their medicine. Then three is sometimes it's sickness. We saw a lot of this during COVID time where someone used to be a very well controlled diabetic, but then when COVID comes, the sugars just shoot. And it's not just COVID, this happens with many other illnesses. When someone gets sick, the sugars go high. Sometimes it's pain, sometimes it's, uh, it's an infection. So whenever your sugars go high, think could it an infection if you're feeling unwell go get checked because it could just be an infection then another thing that uh, that uh, could be there to make the sugars go high is pregnancy there are some people who are diabetic and then they get pregnant then now during the pregnancy there's a lot of insulin resistance so the sugars go high so if you're pregnant and you are already someone with diabetes be careful continue monitoring your sugars because they can go higher and uh, then make sure that you have been treated accordingly. So an emergency is the low sugar. The high sugar is not really an emergency, but even you start thinking what could have been the trigger and then go see the doctor so that you can together find an uh, alternative or a way forward for, uh, for your sugars. Or maybe even your, your, your medicine is no longer working and you might need to be converted from oral medicine to insulin or from two medicines to three medicines. So sometimes naturally diabetes gets worse. So for, some, for many people with time, the sugar levels just get worse. So initially you needed one pill, then you find you need two pills, then you need three pills, then sometimes you're converted to insulin and it's a natural progression of diabetes. So all those things come into play. Then uh, are there any support groups or resources for people living with diabetes? I think by, by, by default already, this is one of them. Uh, I know, Duncan, y yes, yes. Uh, so you can talk more about your support group. Yes, so, uh, say something. all right. Um, of course, we really have a lot of support groups and also including a page by Dr. Hilda, which is called Diabetes Dr. KE, which of course are, I think, uh, on leveraging on the power of social media. And because of course we are in the age of technology, most of our, the folks are, if you if you go online and search for the Diabetes and Hypertension Support Group, you'll find our group with more than 17,000 members. Of course, we also operate uh, other five WhatsApp groups. In fact, I was looking at our support groups. Currently, we have uh, 1,900 and about eight, seven members. So we have a lot of resources in terms and of support groups. And one of the things that we are keen uh, to in doing this year, and, and of course with Dr. Hilda, is that we would also want to even uh, sort of organize some fiscal meetups. God willing, once in a quarter, at least one, one every, in, in every quarter. So those are some of the, 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 the support groups that we have. So Dr. if I could quickly jump to another question that I'm, I'm seeing here. Is it okay to have insulin and glucomet tablets if HbA1c is above 16? uh okay first of all it's been c above 16 like we have already read in class today that is not a good hba1c and you really need to work around that and find out what is happening yeah. now about giving insulin and and glucomet together there's a reason why we do that so i know many the money the practice was where we remove you from oral medicine and we put you only on insulin until studies showed that when you're given both insulin and glucomet, the glucomet helps the insulin to come into the cell properly. So it's a, what we call synergistic action. So um, insulin is in your system, but glucomet helps the insulin to come into the cell properly. So it, it helps with insulin uh, to reduce insulin resistance. 
and it helps insulin sensitivity in the muscles and in the fat cells. That's why we give them combined. So yes, it is good to get both of them uh, for type two. For type one, not so much. Most of the type ones, they are fine with insulin alone. But uh, type two, you do both. But then this person who has a of 16% really needs to recheck the, the dose of insulin. There's something wrong. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Um, uh, so there's another question here. Um, how can one calculate the amount of insulin to inject? I know you've, you've talked uh, in depth about different types of insulin, so, you know, and all that. But uh, I, I think I see this member has posted this question like three times. So how can one calculate the amount of insulin to inject? So uh, generally, the... the um, sorry, sorry, Dr. Ari. Uh, a, mo a moment. I need to mute someone here. Uh, okay. So let's let's go on. Okay, so uh, first of all, it's important to know that um, the, the way your doctor has already calculated your insulin levels, hopefully, is because they have looked at your weight, they have looked at how much you need, and then they give you a certain uh, dose based on what your needs are. So there's a particular dose you've already been prescribed insulin for. However, there are things called corrective doses, which look at uh, what your sugar, if your sugar level was high, then you have to give the next dose of insulin with higher level to correct that high sugar and still take care of the meal that you're about to take. It's a whole thing. And I think, uh, Duncan, if you can permit me, it is one of those topics which will need a bit because it's like a math lesson. I, I agree. Can we have another? I agree. Another yes. yes. Yes, I agree. And in fact, and now we can. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Dr. Ari, I actually wanted to go further and say that uh, some of these um, cases and individuals, to be honest, I think it's best also if they visited or, you know, they came to see a doctor, it's much better, uh, uh, you know, as opposed to uh, the online platform. And, and uh, just to comment on the same, and, and this goes to everyone, um, I really, one of the the th one of the, the, the challenge I've seen with some of our support groups, and, and I hope oh, most of our members are listening, this is, is, is um, our support support groups don't sort, sort of like intend to replace your doctor. And, and uh, this is one of the things that actually mm -hmm. I've been weighing this year. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, to, 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 to most, mo most members feel like, you know, once you're on this platform, once you attend these webinars, you know, that's all you need. No, you still need to go see your doctor. You still need to go, you know, out there and, uh, you know, take your tests. So these are some of the things that I want to encourage everyone that in as much as we have these support groups, please remember these support groups are just to empower you and give you this little bit of information here and they encourage you, you know, a, 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 a sort of like accept the condition and many other things. But it does not replace the relationship that you should have with your doctor. So we should re probably revisit that, but I would still further recommend that uh, some of these uh, uh, people to be able to come and and uh, to be to go to their doctors or be able to come to see to see you. So the, the we've got a few minutes because I, I just wanted us to sort of like uh, talk a little bit, Doctor, uh, with the, maybe the last five minutes on where you found the rest of the things that we are doing. Uh, but there's a question that I've seen here that I wanted to ask, sort of like um, uh, uh, ask just a moment. Uh, so there's somebody who had asked, what is when is the best time to take metformin? Mm. So it depends on whether you get uh, tummy upset. You know, the, the metformin has a lot of uh, tummy issues for some people. Uh, for some people, we even stop it because of that. Some, we reduce the dose because of that. So generally, most people find that it is easier to take it with meals or after meals. Uh, for those who can tolerate, tolerate it before meals, it's still okay. But uh, many people take it with meals. Hello? Sorry, sorry, Dr. Ari, I was muted. Uh, just probably one more question now before we jump into the last part of the, the last session, part of the session, session. Is there, are there any oral drugs that a person with type one can take to help with blood sugar regulation? Yes, so um, the blood sugar regulation, uh, sorry, let me... I, Dr. I don't know if it's just me, but uh, I kind of lost you. Uh, if you can hear oh, me. Oh, I had, I had muted. There's someone who ah. had put some, some oh. noise near okay. them to shut it. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, we were talking about... Uh, type 1, uh, somebody, somebody was asking yes, uh, the, uh, this question. Oro. Yes, yes, type 1 and oral. Yes. Now, I want you to remember one thing. A type 1 person was born uh, and then the insulin level is no longer being uh, produced. The insulin is not being produced well. But this type 1 person is still going to be a person who will uh, eat the way we eat. They might gain weight just like the rest of us. And type one nowadays, I've, I've, I saw a comment somewhere, someone wrote that, you know, people shouldn't uh, uh, calculate their own insulin levels. But the interesting thing is type ones nowadays are being empowered to be able to know how much insulin to give themselves. So that's why I was telling you calculating insulin is a formula that with time type ones are able to know. They can even eat cake if they want. Because remember their issue, is not like a type two issue. Their issue is not that uh, they, they have insulin, but they are, they, they are obese or it's not working well. Their issue is just that they are just like us, but they are not producing insulin. So all they need is insulin. So many of them, they're even eating cake. They can look at how much cake they're eating and then they convert. They look at how many grams is in that cake of carbohydrate. They know how much their body is able to take. They take that insulin and then they uh, inject whatever is equivalent to that cake. So it's a whole calculation and it takes very good diabetes education, very good. Eh? But those people who have been to good diabetes education programs are actually able to eat anything they want and they're able to control it with insulin. But now the problem is we are seeing more people with type one now becoming obese because they are, they are eating just like anyone else and they are controlling their sugar like anyone else. So now what happens is that now they become obese and now they get insulin resistance. And now what happens is that they have an element of resistance on top of insulin deficiency. So because of that, now um, we actually also can give people with type 1 uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. They can also, so the SGLT2 inhibitors for them can help with glycemic control, but it can also help to control their heart, their, to, to protect their heart and their kidney, just like the, the way we do for type, uh, type uh, twos. And they can also be given metformin. Those ones who look like they have insulin resistance can also be given metformin. So the answer is yes, depending on the case, but majority of the time it's those people who are now developing insulin resistance on top of the insulin deficiency, sorry. All right, thank you, Dr. Uh, the last question, uh, because of time, and, and I want to apologize to uh, all the members, not really apologize, but I also want to say that we are going to schedule another webinar uh, to, to be able to answer some of the other questions that uh, we were not able to answer because of time. But I want to combine this. Um, so there, there's a question here that um, says, I'm diabetic and my feet and leg muscles have become numb. I can't walk without a walking stick. How do I manage this? And I want to tie this to another question that I'm seeing here on the group is neuropathy reversible. That's a very good question. Very good question. Now, unfortunately, uh, nerves take a very long time to heal. Nerves are not like uh, you cutting your finger. Muscle heals very quickly, but nerves take a very long time to heal. And that's why prevention is always better than cure. And for those who have never uh, developed symptoms of neuropathy or symptoms of eye issues, please make sure you are well controlled. Do anything you can to ensure that you are well controlled. And even if you already have neuropathy, control your sugars so that you prevent this. Now that said, once you have neuropathy, unfortunately, it's very rare that your nerves will get back to normal. So for some, if you bring down the sugar levels, especially when it's just beginning, when the nerves are still in that early phase of being damaged, it's easy to, to bring back the neuropathy and uh, the symptoms can go. But for those who've had these symptoms for a long time, unfortunately, um, it's extremely difficult to reverse. It can be managed by medication, but it cannot be reversed. So that's why prevention is always better than cure. Uh, so for the, to answer the person who asked about reversibility, uh, only in the early stages. When it's late, then it's just about managing with medication. And many times someone has to be on medicine for life. So prevention is the best thing. Now for the person who said that they have symptoms and they're even not able to walk, first of all, um, I'd like to um, ask you to ensure that you have taken vitamin B12 levels 
uh, vitamin B12, especially for people who have taken metformin for a very long time, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency can happen as a side effect. So ensure that you've done vitamin B12 levels because they can cause uh, nerve damage. And then secondly, uh, talk to your doctor, make sure that you have a medicine on board for your nerves. And if it's only one, let them go to combination therapy. So there are different drugs that work from different um, areas of the nerve. So uh, the drugs can be titrated. Usually what we find is that we underdose medication a lot. So ensure that you're on the right dose. If the current dose is not working, the dose can be increased uh, to be better. So ensure that that has been done. And then if you're even having muscle issues, uh, sometimes diabetes can even affect the muscle itself, not just the nerve. So um, it's very important to ensure that you have done, if possible, something called a nerve conduction test and an electromyogram, EMG and NCS. Those are, those are tests that can be done to ascertain and see whether maybe you're actually getting another issue in your nerve and in your muscle above just the common neuropathy. So sometimes we don't just assume that someone has neuropathy. It's good to do further tests to ensure that the muscle is okay and the other nerves are okay. So uh, talk to your doctor or come for review if you can, so that we can ascertain what the cause of the problem is. But remember still, when it comes to diabetes complications, prevention is always better than cure. Make sure the sugar control is good. And even for the patient who already has the symptoms, ensure that you have good sugar control. It can help improve the symptoms. They might not go away totally, but they will improve. Thank you, Dr. Hari. Bonus and final question, I promise you. What, <laughs> what, for what period of time can you a can, type 1... Can give... Yes, no, this is the last one, Dr. Hari. For what period... Uh... Done, we can yes. give, uh, can give uh, 10 more minutes ah, because okay. I can see there are so ah. many... Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Ari. So for what period of time can a, a type 1 stay without insulin? Interesting question. A type 1 should not stay without insulin. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm probably imagining, no Dr. Ari, I'm imagining probably they're in a situation where, yes. Please go on. Where what? I wanted to say they're in a situation maybe for any reason. Excuses. Okay, okay. Yeah. No, I don't want people to have excuses. A type one should have insulin at all times. All right. Uh, okay. So they need it. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ari. Uh, I guess uh, we have probably uh, exhausted um, all the questions that I could see. I, I see one member here really thanking you, um, Asante Sana, who is this? Uh, thank, thank you for the compliments. Um, I, I guess probably we are done for today. Uh, so, oh, yeah, yeah I, I, I was looking. I have I was... someone... I think I've seen another, another question over here. All right. oh, okay, two questions. Yeah? yeah. One who, no, there's actually a comment which I think is very good, who is saying that I've noticed that taking drugs at a specific time helps instead of erratic times. That's very important. That is from Grace Gashagwa. It's very important to have a calendar so that you know at 10 p.m., I'm taking this drug. At this time, I'm taking this drug. So please be consistent. Consistency is key. So that's a very good comment. Then there's a question here about is type 1 reversible? Unfortunately, it is not. So there are many new things that are being studied. They want to study whether they can do pancreas transplant, pancreas uh, uh, embryonic uh, stem cell transplant. There are so many things, but it's important for you to know that once you live with type one, just live positively. Oh, I have seen my friend Newton is here. Newton runs a group for type one diabetes, a support group called uh, Young and Sweet. And young and sweet helps people with type 1 to embrace their condition and live with it positively. So I would encourage any type 1 to uh, join the group called Young and Sweet. Uh, young, UN, sweet, and sweet. Okay. And then, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So all type 1s, please kindly move, uh, do, do, do that. And then uh, there's another one who's asking about ladder. Uh, type 1.5 diabetes. So LADA is another type of diabetes which uh, comes in, it looks like a, uh, like a type 1 diabetes, but it doesn't really, it, it, it kind of mimics 
uh, type 2 diabetes and then it turns into a type 1 diabetes and it's because of autoimmune um, antibodies to the pancreas so there are some autoimmune uh, uh, antibodies that attack the pancreas and then with time they make it inefficient so someone progresses and needs insulin with time yes so LADA, can it progress to type 2? No, it actually progresses at some point to type 1. Okay. Uh, can it improve to type 2? If there was an element of insulin resistance um, and someone reduces the insulin resistance, it can improve, I guess. But many times it just moves to type 1. Okay. So any other? Uh, yeah, I think that's it. No, I'll yeah, that's, back that's... To you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. I can't thank you enough. Uh, new Tony Ngugi, um, great, great job uh, with Young and Sweet. Uh, so Asante Nisan also for our audience, for creating time, you know, you from out, I guess, out of your busy schedules, you know, it's night, uh, day night, it's at night. So I really thank everyone also for finding time to join us. So uh, we have clinics with the uh, uh, Dr. at uh, the MMC in Ngara. Um, Dr. I just out of curiosity, because I, I kind of get this question a lot, because I know we've got members from different regions and all that. Um, what's your take uh, on virtual consultations? Yeah, I do virtual consultations. Um, uh, my, I have a, I also have, a, I do uh, DMMC. We are starting the clinics with DMMC twice a month, but I also do online consultations. Okay. So I would encourage you to uh, book okay. consults. Okay. And um, yeah. Ah, okay, great, great. Happy to hear that. So our first clinic uh, with uh, Dr. Tari will be on 14th, uh, that is on Saturday. Um, I have shared numbers in our groups, but just in case we have got new members here who probably have joined from different platforms, uh, please take this number down uh, so that you are able to communicate and also schedule your booking, whether it's virtual, whether it's uh, at the clinic. Uh, the number is 0700 uh, 0700 Oh seven zero zero five eight two one three four. So for 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 some of those, you know, some of our members, especially from our WhatsApp groups, uh, you know, you we we have interacted several times. Uh, you know, uh, we have walked this journey, of course, of in trying to educate people since twenty fourteen. Our platforms actually have been in existence for more than eight years. So I'm really also happy to have Dr. Tari uh, on board, and we look forward to supporting you manage your you know your condition. We look forward to helping you even get uh, drugs affordably, tests affordably, and hopefully you know inspire you also most importantly as dr said change your lifestyle eat a, 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 a embrace a healthy lifestyle exercise eat well and i guess all will be well so as Anten sana i uh, will uh, share this recording later on with dr is permission especially on our whatsapp groups and i will also communicate when we will have our next uh, webinar so as anteni thank you very much oh before we leave yes uh, Dan, can you yes about my handles my handles are diabetes doc underscore ke on Instagram and Twitter, those who are on Instagram and Twitter. And then on uh, Facebook, I'm Diabetes Dr. KE. So just feel free to like and subscribe and share. Great. Like, subscribe and share. Asante Nisana. Doctor, maybe you could repeat that once more. So Diabetes Doc underscore KE on Twitter and Instagram. And then on uh, Facebook, which uh, actually you've even tagged me, I'm diabetes doctor KE. All right. Asante sana. Usikumema kila mtu. And uh, God bless. Asante sana. All right.